good morning, church family. It is good to see you all this morning. I don't know how I am supposed to follow that up. I uh, love that song, love singing glory to God. Amen. As you turn to 1 Samuel chapter 3, will you turn to someone and tell them how good it is to see them this morning? First Samuel chapter 3 is where we will be this morning. We are in our second week of a new sermon series where we are exploring the books of First and Second Samuel. We're calling it Rise and Fall because as we go through this book, we see heroes, leaders rise and then fall. Today we are going to see uh, several in particular start to fall from God's grace and one in particular start to rise. So as we go through this book, the, one of the great things about the Old Testament is it so often points us toward Jesus. So often it gives us a, a shadow, is what Hebrews calls it, a shadow of what was to come. As we looked at the story of Hannah last week, we saw how Hannah had a deep hurt in her life. She was in a hopeless situation battling infertility. She was tormented by Elkanah's other wife, Penina. And the other wife, Penina, constantly tormented Hannah, it said year after year after year, about how she didn't have children. And despite Elkanah's love, despite him giving her a double portion of mashed potatoes, because nothing says I love you, baby, quite like a double portion of mashed potatoes. I had several text messages from last week where some of y'all tried that out. I hope it worked for you, okay? Last week, we, we just explored and unpacked this story, and how ultimately Hannah's hope was not in a child, but the hope was in the God of the universe, the God that we just lifted up and sang glory to, the God that comforts you and I in our infirmities, in our hopeless situations. Today, we are going to look at Hannah's firstborn son, Samuel. We're going to look at Samuel's call today. So look with me at 1 Samuel chapter 3, starting in verse 1. It says, now the boy Samuel was ministering to the Lord in the presence of Eli. Now, pause here. Remember that Hannah dedicated Samuel to the temple through a Nazarite vow. The only way that you could serve in the temple was for you to be born in the tribe of Levi. But Samuel was not born in the tribe of Levi. So Hannah said, God, if you will give me a son, I will dedicate him with a Nazarite vow, which means that Samuel would have to disavow. He would no longer be connected to any inheritance that he would have from his family. His mom, Hannah, and his dad, Elkanah, would probably only see Samuel once a year. So Samuel is ministering under the tutelage, under the privilege of Eli, who's operating as the high priest at this time. And so Samuel grows up under the direction and the guidance of Eli. Let's jump back into verse 1 and keep reading. It says, and the word of the Lord was rare in those days. There was no frequent vision. At that time, Eli, whose eyesight had begun to grow dim so that he could not see, was lying down in his own place. Apparently, Eli here is very old, and his eyesight has begun to grow dim. Many of you are at that stage in life. You understand this very well. You have to play trombone every time you read the newspaper, or your kids trying to show you pictures. You play trombone to try to dial it in into whatever the vision is that you have. Apparently, Eli is so old that his eyesight is growing dim. But this is also a metaphor, because the nation of Israel was spiritually dark at this time said in verse 1 that the word of the Lord was very rare in those days. There was no frequent vision. You see the connection here. Eli's eyesight is growing dim physically. It's a metaphor also for the nation of Israel. Their eyesight is growing dim as well. So just like Eli can barely see physically, the nation of Israel can barely see spiritually. And one of the reasons for this spiritual blindness is a lack of leadership and the ultimate corruption of leadership in Israel. You see, Eli had two sons, Hophni and Phinehas or Phineas, however you would like to pronounce it. And these two sons had started serving as priests at the temple in Shiloh because of Eli's old age. Eli, again, had gotten to the point, like most old men, where he's probably doing the shuffle as he walks, right? He's got the odor of Ben Gay and Icy Hot on him everywhere he goes just to get up in the morning. His eyesight has grown dim. 
So his two sons take over the primary duties of operating as the priest at the temple there in Shiloh. And these two sons are extremely corrupt. In chapter 2, verse 12, it says, Now the sons of Eli were worthless men. And that worthless men is a very strong term in the Hebrew language. They are worthless men. They did not know the Lord. Chapter 2, you can go and read it later this week, talks about and describes how Hophni and Phinehas were serving as priests at the temple there in Shiloh, and they were extorting money from the people. As people would bring in money to the church, they would go out in the offering boxes before they would go and count it, and they'd get out all the cash, and they'd put it in their pockets. Moreover, they were misusing the funds that were intended for the temple, and they were using it for their own personal gains. They're taking the food offerings that are coming in, and they're literally sticking a fork in the food offerings as it's coming, and just taking a bite as they go. These men are greedy and lazy, And it says also in chapter 2 that these men are forcing themselves on women who are serving at the entrance to the temple. Unfortunately, we have become so used to this level of corruption and moral decay from leadership in our country. This is just the normal for us. It is meant to shock us because these two sons are religious leaders. Hollywood rarely depicts religious leaders in their movies, in their shows, as men of good moral character. Hollywood often depicts religious leaders as men who are inept, pretty dumb. They obviously looked at me in my life. I won't won't say you, although you may agree. They depict us as religious leaders as being just morally corrupt, able to be swayed back and forth by money or whoever wants to bribe us. And why would they not? When we look around today, we see so many religious leaders today falling from grace. Too many religious leaders are falling due to moral and a spiritual obligation they are supposed to uphold. They are falling prey to it. Southern Baptist Convention plagued by so many abuse scandals that have been covered up over the years. Catholic Church, I mean, we can go around and just name names and start calling people out. We are plagued by it as religious leaders, as entities at the church today. All too often on the news, they report similar things in other leadership positions. CEOs smuggling funds for themselves, doing some stock trading that are behind the scenes that are illegal. Principals and teachers convicted of sexual abuse against minors, starting OnlyFans accounts, whatever. I mean, we could just go on and on about what fills our headlines with leaders who are falling from grace. This is meant to shock us when we read about Hophni and Phinehas doing the things that they are doing, yet so often we are so calloused by it because it is so common in our country and in our world today. It is meant to shock us. The nation of Israel was supposed to be the holy nation, called out by God as a nation of priests, it says in Exodus chapter 19. Hophni and Phinehas are serving in the temple, in the tabernacle, supposed to be lifting up, pointing the nation of Israel's eyes toward God, and yet all they are doing is patting their pocketbooks, stealing funds, stealing food, stealing women. These men are not living the example that they were supposed to live. And what's bad is that Eli knew about it. Their dad knew about it and yet did not rebuke his sons strong enough for their corruption and their sin. So God tells Eli in chapter 2 that he will cut off Eli's household from ever serving as priests. These two sons are going to die on the same day. And the Ark of the Covenant is going to be taken from the nation of Israel in battle. God tells Eli this. He says this is going to be done. He's wiping his hands clean. In chapter 2, verse 35, he says, I will raise up for myself a faithful priest who shall do according to what is in my heart and in my mind. Yes, this is a picture toward Jesus, but it's also a picture toward an even closer shadow in David, that he is going to be a man after God's own heart, as you often remember from Sunday school class. In the face of all this sin and disgrace, God promises that he is going to raise up a new leader, one who is selfless and faithful, who will follow God's heart and mind, not one that is perfect necessarily in David, but ultimately pointing to the one who is in Jesus. Now back to chapter 3. It's a spiritually dark time for the nation of Israel, but verse 3 goes, the lamp of God had not yet gone out. Despite the darkness, despite the decay, despite all of this that's going on, despite the 
account that we just read or went over in chapter 2 about how dark this is. The lamp of God had not yet gone out. Both where Samuel is sleeping or we're about to see, but also metaphorically in the nation of Israel, there is not hope that has not gone out yet. There is still hope for the nation of Israel. And Samuel was lying down in the temple of the Lord where the ark of God was. Then Samuel called to, or the Lord called to Samuel and he said, here I am. And he ran to Eli and said, here I am for you called me. But he, Eli said, I did not call, lie down again. So he went away and lay down. Parents, AKA this is don't bug me, go get your mama, okay? Verse four, then the Lord called to Samuel and he said, here I am. And he read to Eli and said, here I am for you called me. He said, I did not call, lie down again. A.K.A., boy, you better get that back to bed. I ain't calling you. Verse 6. And the Lord called again, Samuel. And Samuel arose, and he went to Eli, and he said, Here I am, for you called me. He said, I didn't call my son, lie down again. Now Samuel did not yet know the Lord, and the word of the Lord had not yet been revealed to him. And the Lord called to Samuel again a third time, and he arose and went to Eli and said, Here I am, for you have called me. Then Eli perceived that the Lord was calling the boy. Therefore, Eli said to Samuel, go lie down, and if he calls, you shall say, speak, Lord, for your servant hears. We're going to swing back to that toward the end of the message today. So Samuel went, and he lay down in his place. And the Lord came and stood, calling as at the other time, Samuel, Samuel. And Samuel said, speak, for your servant hears. Then the Lord said to Samuel, Behold, I'm about to do a thing in Israel at which the two ears of everyone who hears it will tingle. On that day I will fulfill against Eli all that I have spoken concerning his house from beginning to end. A.K.A. I'm going to destroy his two sons. I'm going to take the Ark of the Covenant. Eli's house is going to be cut off for forever. That is what he is saying that he will speak. And I declare to him that I'm about to punish his house forever for the iniquity that he knew because his sons were blaspheming God and he did not restrain them. Therefore, I swear to the house of Eli that the iniquity of Eli's house shall not be atoned for by sacrifice or offering forever. Samuel lay down till the morning. Then he opened the doors of the house of the Lord, and Samuel was afraid to tell the vision to Eli. But Eli called to Samuel and said, Samuel, my son. He said, here I am. Eli said, what was it that he, the Lord, told you? Do not hide it from me. May God do so to you and more also if you hide anything from me, that all that he had told you. So Samuel told him everything, and he hid nothing from him. And he, Eli, said, it is the Lord. Let him do what seems good to him. So Samuel has a conversation that he dreads after God speaks to him. His mentor, his, a.k.a. his dad, because you hear how Eli referred to Samuel. Samuel, my son. He's grown up under Eli's tutelage. He hasn't seen his mom or dad but once a year since he was born and dedicated to the Nazarite vow. Eli is like a father to him. And God just told Samuel to tell his mentor, his AKA dad, the man who loved him and raised him, that he and his household are going to be cut off for forever. The thing that you have given your entire life dedicated to. You are the high priest. God is going to cut you and your household off forever. Your two sons are going to die in battle. This is a difficult message to preach, to tell to your father. Talk about a tough first sermon to give. Now, my first sermon was awful, but it didn't have near enough pressure that this did. Many of you were here for that first sermon. Thank you for being gracious. But I can't imagine if God had called me to stand up here before you as a first sermon, as a young man, to look out at so many of you in your faces, people that I've walked with and been in hospitals with, and say, God is going to cut your house forever. It's a tough message. But Samuel faithfully delivered that message, which sets an important precedent for his future. Because Samuel is about to step in as operating as the high priest of the nation of Israel, both priest and prophet. He's going to have these duties. It sets the stage for him that he is going to be faithful to relay what God has to say, no matter how difficult it is. This is so important for you and I. It is so important, especially for me or Rick or whoever stands in front of you to proclaim the word of God every single week. 
Because week after week, whoever stands in this spot faces the temptation when we open the word of God to declare it as it is, as God has said, no matter how difficult it is. Whether you want to hear it or not, God's word still reigns supreme. Every week I face the temptation to affirm what our culture affirms. Tell you what you want to hear rather than what you need to hear. To stand up here and contradict what the word of God says just because the Bible says that it's wrong. Whether our culture agrees with it or not. Too many churches today, too many staff committees or pulpit committees that call pastors value so much more talent than they do character. Just because someone can stand up here and preach one good sermon and we expect for that person to be able to determine whether or not we want to call them as a pastor. We so often prioritize talent in who can sing and lead us in songs or who can organize us as a church to do this or that. We prioritize talent so often we neglect character. Is it a wonder and a mystery why so many leaders fall from grace? We don't challenge them to build their character. We don't challenge to hold them accountable to the word of God. Just can you preach a sermon? Can you make me feel good? Can you make me laugh? This is the temptation every single week of whoever stands in this spot. Too many pastors today have turned their calling into a career where it's so much more about networking at conferences, so much more about hobnobbing around with somebody else. They're not worried about pastoring the church that God has actually called them to here. They're just trying to get to the next step. So what we're going to do is we're going to stay away from difficult topics that the Bible has to say. And we're going to move around that to make sure that I don't think, say things that's going to hurt my resume for the next church. I don't want to step out on that cultural limb because it's going to hurt. This is the temptation every single week for whoever stands in this spot. It's temptation for you and your church, whether you call this church your home or not. This is the temptation. So many pastors today, because they are chasing a career rather than a calling, are just chasing likes and followings and retweets rather than developing their character and actually following the word of God. Chasing the applause of men rather than the applause of God Almighty. Willing to preach what they want to hear rather than what the difficult truth is to hear. So these are the two takeaways from this passage this morning. The first one is, hear the hard truth. Hear the hard truth. You and I need to make sure that we put ourselves in a place where we can hear the hard and difficult truth of the word of God that so often you and I don't want to hear. I don't know whether you know this yet or not in your Christian journey and where you are. But at some point in your Christian journey, the word of God is going to be difficult. It's going to be difficult to digest. It's going to make you mad. It's going to step on your toes. This is what the word of God does. You have to make a decision when those times come. Are you going to listen to what the word of God says? Is it a hard truth for you to hear? Or are you just going to move around that topic because it doesn't really feel good? The Bible never has and never will affirm anyone just the way they are. You and I are sinners in need of grace. It doesn't matter what your sin is compared to mine. It doesn't matter what your sin is compared to the person sitting next to you. You and I are sinful. And God calls us out in that sin. The Bible, like a mirror, reflects back on us. And it shows us who we really are. Now, you may not like the picture that it shows you, just like you may not like the picture that you see in the mirror when you wake up in the morning. But a mirror never lies. It shows you just the way you are. Stretch marks. It just shows you. The Bible is hard to digest sometimes. So many times people ask questions about the Bible where they think the Bible is unclear. The difference, the difference for so many people, they don't understand that there is a difference between the Bible being unclear and the Bible being unpopular. There's a difference between the Bible being unclear and the Bible being unpopular. So many people today want to look at scripture and they want to say that it is being unclear when all it is is it's just not a popular topic to think about or talk about. You hear this and so often with 
whether it's pastors or people that are talking online, TikToks and short videos or whatever else, and they're questioning things about Scripture. And it's not that the Bible is being unclear. It's that it's just unpopular. We want to find Bible verses to back up our unpopular opinion. We want to make the Bible bend to what we want it to say rather than bending ourselves to align with what Scripture is. So many people find the Bible unclear on things in our culture today. God's design for marriage between one man and one woman. God's design and intention for gender, abortion, God's design for sex only within the confines of marriage. But we could just go on and on and on. The Bible is not unclear on any of these things. Yet it is unpopular in our culture because, well, it's just not what I want to hear. This is the difficulty of Scripture. This is the story, the, the thing that we learn in Samuel's story. It is, we have to put ourselves in the place where we have to hear the hard truth. Like Eli, who did not want to hear this, but the reality was, that was what God's message to Eli was. Whether you want to hear it or not is irrelevant. The Word of God doesn't change. I don't care what our culture says. I don't care what my children, whenever they grow up, I don't care what their culture says. The Word of God is unchanging. We can cry about it. We can talk about it. There are things in there that maybe we question about it, that we in our humanity don't understand fully. But the word of God is clear. The question is whether you are going to align your life to it or not. Again, there is a difference on the Bible being unclear and it just being unpopular today. Put yourself in a place where the word of God is preached. Whether it's here or another church. Again, the temptation is to stand here every single Sunday and preach what you want to hear. You need this as a church to hear the hard truth. You need me to be this as your pastor. You don't need me to stand up here and throw you Cheerios and what you want to hear. You need to hear the hard truth. Yet there are so many men that are standing in this pulpit area today that have turned it into a career rather than a calling, who just want to push out soft messages rather than the Word of God. The Word of God is going to hit you in your face. It's not me stepping on your toes. It's the Word of God. I have to do my best to make sure I don't just go and seek out a target of whatever the topic is to make sure I don't just bend the Bible over here to make sure because y'all really need to hear this and let me go and turn the Bible into that. It's a temptation one way or the other. But the word of God, whether we like it or not, is going to slam us in our face. This is the reality for you and I today. So pray for your pastor to have clarity and courage to separate my opinions from the word of God. Pray that I will be bold and preach and teach what God's word says, regardless of how unpopular it may be in today's culture, because you need that just as much as I do. I need to develop my character much more than I need to develop my preaching skills or the jokes that I tell or whatever else. And again, it doesn't matter whether it's me up here or anybody else. We need to put ourselves in a place where the word of God is preached. And if you go somewhere and they're not proclaiming the word of God, if you go there and they're not stepping on your toes, Maybe, perhaps, they're not preaching the Word of God. Maybe, perhaps, that man has started to compromise his character and his calling. Not saying definitively, just suggesting that the Word of God needs to be proclaimed. Proclaimed boldly and proclaimed loudly. Second thing that you and I can take away from this passage this morning is that we need to surrender to God's call. We need to surrender to God's call. That's not necessarily a call to be a pastor although there needs to be a whole lot more calls for that today. It's a massive shortage of pastors and people who want to go into ministry today. Maybe that is you, perhaps, but it doesn't have to be that. God's call for you in your life, you have to surrender to it. When God called Samuel, Samuel's response by Eli, he said, was simply speak, Lord, your servant hears. In other words, Samuel is saying, Lord, my answer is yes before you even ask a question. All God did was say his name. And Samuel was saying, speak, Lord, your servant hears. Yes, my answer is yes, before you even ask. Here it is on the table, God. Whatever you say, I am willing to do it. There are so many today who, people today who follow God based on conditions. We don't want to say that we follow God based on conditions, but that's often what we do. They want God to guide them in their lives, but they want God to be like the bumper sticker. They want God to be the co-pilot. Or maybe God's in control right now, but I got that 
driver's ed emergency brake pedal, right? Some of you wives, when your husband is driving, you have that emergency brake pedal that's sitting right there, right? Whenever they get a little too close or not braking as quickly as what you think they should, that foot is hitting that floorboard. Ooh, you're trying to stop that car with that foot. That's what we often do whenever we follow God's word. We have conditions on it. We want to use that brake pedal to veto what God says. God calls you to a mission trip overseas. Nope, slamming on that brake pedal. Vetoing that ain't happening, God. God calls your children to go on a mission trip overseas. You're not going to see them for a week. They might die. Nope, slamming on that brake pedal. God calls you to step out, start attending a Sunday school class, start actually coming on Wednesday night, get involved here by serving. Nope, slamming on that brake pedal. God's word hits you in the face with something in your life, calling you to forgive that person that you really don't want to forgive because they hurt you so many years ago. Veto power comes out again, slamming on the brake pedal. That ain't happening, God. To follow Jesus means that you give up your power to veto. When we say yes to Jesus, when we put our yes on the table before God even asks the question, we say no to our veto power. He is the King of kings and the Lord of lords. When he is your Lord, your veto power is gone, or it should be. And I may, may not like it when God calls me to another church or to a mission trip overseas or to serve as a missionary or whatever but I have given up my right to veto. So should we. Maybe God is calling you to take a less a pay cut at your job so you can be home more with your children. Maybe God is calling you to forgive that person. I don't know what it is in your life, but surrender to God's call because Jesus is the king of kings, not the king of suggestions. That veto power goes away when you call and you are surrendered to him so the question is have you surrendered to God's call when he speaks to you are you like Samuel when God calls and speaks is your answer yes before you even hear the question are you so much more like Eli and his sons that have so become so spiritually blind that you are ignoring your sin before a holy God surrender to his call hear the hard truth these are our takeaways this morning will you stand with me God, we praise you. God, because we are fearfully and wonderfully made. You knit us together in our mother's womb. God, we may not know why this is happening, what our call is in our life. God, there are so many unanswered questions for so many people in here. But our yes, God, I pray that our yes is on the table. We leave our yes at the altar. No matter what the question is, no matter what the calling is, there are so many people just like what I used to do, running away from their calling from you. God, running away in the opposite direction, trying to do everything they possibly can to fight against what you would have for them. Isn't it tiring? God, may we, may they surrender to your will. May we submit ourselves to the hard truth of the word of God rather than trying to force it to align with our lives. God, may you cut us wide open and expose our hearts and the sin that is in our hearts. It is in your holy and precious name we pray. Amen. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound.
has been good to be in God's house today. I'm going to ask you real quick to have a seat, uh, just where you are. I know this is not necessarily normal. Andrew, we've got eight, whenever you get ready. Um, no, I'm not leaving, okay? That was not a, a, I'm about to be called to somewhere else. Everybody calm down, all right? Okay. Speak, speak, Lord, your servant hears. <laughs> um, there is a business meeting at the end of the month. Uh, the property team has a proposal for that business meeting that they're going to announce about today. There will be letters out in the foyer area back there today. Whenever we go out, they will be available for you to pick one up and check on. Um, over the last 14 years uh, since Rick got here, uh, we've done a, a good job as a church and a property team to keep everything up and repair a lot of the buildings that have gone on. Many of you are aware of many of those upgrades and changes that have happened over the last 14 years. God has blessed this church tremendously. Amen. God has blessed us to be able to upgrade so many buildings, renovate the sanctuary this past year, do so much, pay off the debt that the church had, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. On and on we could go just lifting God's name up. And through all of that, we have had a surplus in giving, and we have been under on spending almost every year in that 14 years. Over the last four-ish years, Rick, myself, and the property team have been working toward the future. Now, let me go ahead and address this. No, we are not building a building, okay? If you hear that, I have done a bad job communicating. These two men that are about to come up have done a bad job communicating. Okay? We are not building a building. What we are doing is we are going to make an official proposal, which I'm about to turn over to Neil and Jim to do. And I will get up at the very end and close us out and dismiss us. So just hang tight while they make their presentation, and we'll continue to move forward. Good morning. Uh, the property team is asking the church for $50,000 to be spent over the next three to five years to explore upgrades to our church property. And uh, now I would like my chauffeur to elaborate on that a little bit. They won't even stand up here beside me to do that. <laughs> stuff going on. We need to do some exploration and stuff uh, to facilitate that growth. Some of that involves working with the city. We are in the city limits to get their uh, commitment to us to bring some infrastructure down to us and find out what we need to do to our property to accommodate our growth as it marries to them. So there's a lot of uh, underlying things that have to go into that that we need to be prepared for. We don't know totally what that's going to be until we can go talk to the city. So that'll be part of this is preparation for that and some of that will give you all an opportunity to come and ask questions and stuff and Michael will lay that out for you. So, but we're just trying to be on solid footing to carry the church forward as it uh, pertains to the, to the church, more so larger the church campus you know, in the five buildings that we operate. Thank you. You can get back to the guy in the back. The other chauffeur. <laughs> um, a as they had mentioned, we, we don't want to spend money haphazardly. We've never wanted to do that as a church. So some of this is exploratory things that are going on. You will never necessarily see the benefit of it. It's not renovating a sanctuary. It's background stuff that has to take place. If you have questions about that, there are two question and answer ser services for you to come to. That is this Wednesday, right before the church service at 530, we'll meet in the fellowship hall. And then next Sunday, right after the church service, we'll also meet in the fellowship hall. If you have questions about what those are, you can come to those. Uh, my cell phone is always open. If you don't have that, somebody's got it, I'm sure, around here. So ask somebody about that. Again, we are not building a building. One of the most likely first upgrades that we will have to make as a church is expanding our church parking lot. 
Um, as many of you know, we have been continuing to ask you guys to park further and further away. Uh, Brandon's actually going to be starting some, some work for us this week on an area up there by, between the annex walkway and the road to put down a solid foundation so people can actually drive on it and actually park on it, um, expand some of that. So that's kind of some of what we're talking about. Again, we are not building a building, okay? Everybody, everybody calm down. I'm not that stupid, nor are you, to allow me to run off in that direction, all right? Again, those letters are out there. If you have any questions, they will be out there and available for you. So with that, will you please stand, and I'm going to pray us out, and we are going to be dismissed. <laughs> Father God, we thank you for who you are. Lord, we thank you for the growth of this church. God, it is all for you and for your glory. God, we pray that we will magnify you in everything that we do as a church. God, what we do is our, our lives, that we will reflect you. And God, I pray that we will reflect the gospel in everything that we do, everything that we say, and how we live our lives. God, is in your holy and precious son's name we do pray. Amen. Love you, God.